I don't remember at all being worried about the fact of pretending to be somebody else. I was supposed to play around a bit, get scolded a bit, and do things that this wonderful-looking man asked me to do. <laughs> Mr. Ray was very tall and very handsome. For me then, I was a tiny little girl. I remember so much of those times because they were so unusual for a little girl. When Ray started shooting the section where I do this role of this little girl, that was sometime in 1953, so I would be not yet six years old. I was supposed to be my mother's daughter. That was easy. But I think there were moments when the unreality was very, very evident to me, but it didn't seem to bother me. I was quite happy as if I accepted that these things happened, partly because my mother was on the stage already and I had seen her act. My mother was an extremely beautiful woman. She was conscious of that, but not vain at all. She was more educated than a lot of other women during her time. She was allowed to go to school, college, university, where she met my father. The first stage work that she did was actually for this cultural organization called Indian People's Theatre Association. She also did a lot of street plays, political street plays, during that time. She knew Ray, because Ray was a colleague and friend of my father, even though she was very taken aback when Ray asked her to act in his film and was very much against being a film actress, not done in those days. She eventually got cajoled into it, I think, by the family and my father, and that's how she appears as my mother in Patipachili. <laughs> She loved the book. Her generation had grown up with it. So it was a very challenging and moving role for her to take on. As far as I know from my mother, and they were chatting about all the other roles around Shorbuchar Ahorikar, Opu Durga. We're just looking for a little girl. I was outside the room sitting and playing. And um, apparently he said, she'll do. <laughs> I don't think it was any more dramatic than that. <laughs> My mother was a very, very gentle person, soft-spoken, extremely dignified. She wouldn't raise her voice. She wouldn't slap me, in real life, I mean. She did once, and she immediately burst into tears. She couldn't do those things, except when she acted. <laughs> So this whole role that she had to play, where she's scolding me, she's angry, she's punishing me, all that was just pretend. That's what I remember most, I think, about working with her, that She's so different in real life. She's not at all like that. My mother called me Rumki. Actually, I was called Rumki at home. Bengalis always have two names, one for the home, one for outside. So I hated my name, actually, Shampa, which was my formal name for school and the rest of my life. And Ray said he doesn't like the sound of Shampa. So Runki, I remained for the film. One of my very clear memories of Ray is when there's the sequence where I sit and watch the old aunt eating, and she doesn't notice me, and I'm just watching her eat, and I'm hungry. I remember Ray waited, apparently for the lights to be right, because everything was open to nature, and my mother kept saying, she hasn't eaten, it's getting late, she hasn't eaten. And he would not let me eat. 
he would tell her, wait, you know, it's okay. Wait, we'll just get there. Maybe he was trying to get me hungry. I suspect so. Then he came to me and said, when the old lady is eating, you watch her. Can you sort of gulp? And he gulped. This I remember very clearly, and he had a big Adam's apple which went down and up. I couldn't do it. <laughs> so he said, all right, just look at her hand going up and down, you know, from the bowl to her mouth. So I said, fine. After a little while, he brought me a piece of thread, what we call zari, thread from a sari, and he said, keep playing with it, wrap it around your finger, unravel it, because you need something to do. And we were still waiting for the light. So after a while, unconsciously, I was kind of swinging my leg. Then the light was okay, he said, okay, we'll start now, and I stopped. And he came and said, no, no, don't stop, do that. I remember this thinking that he, you know, it was, I just followed the instructions, it was okay. He would usually sort of squat, sit down, be your level, because otherwise he was so tall for us that it would probably be difficult to convey anything he wanted us to do. The sequence where I'm asked to sweep the courtyard, my sweeping motions went both sides, which meant that the dust was just clouding up on either side of the broom, but nothing was being cleaned and everybody laughed. It was later that I was told I have to broom it one way, not both ways, because that's not the way to use a broom. But of course, we don't have dusty floors in cities, and I was quite unfamiliar with it. The village was very nice to be in. It was not a completely outlandish, different scene for a child from Calcutta to be in. It wasn't just that we read about the villages and villagers and we were brought up on folk tales which were always in either a palace or a village, nothing in between, there was no urban life. We all traveled enough, especially Bengalis are great travelers within the country, and it was always by train, and the train would always go through villages. So a village had its charms, it was green, it was different. It brought in all the stuff that was outside your real life, but was there in another realm. What was strange was what was done to the house, because it was rebuilt. It was a ghost house, it was in ruins, and Bongshi Chandragupta built it, more or less, a lot of it. And that sense of unreality was very curious to go through. I remember the kitchen, which was most surprising, because it had this veranda and a wall, looked exactly what any village home would look like in those days. Mud hut wiped with cow dung water and it leaves its traces around and sweeps. But <laughs> if you touched it, it was just like paper. And that was astonishing for me. I, I just thought it weird that instead of a real wall, he had built this odd thing and stuck it then. It looks like a wall all the same. There was a sequence when the baby is born, Apu is just born, and the old lady and I are supposed to peer into this labor room, as it was in those days, and we were supposed to look at the baby and smile, baby and my mother. There was no baby, there was no mother. There was this large man, sweaty, lying on the floor with a camera. <laughs> and that was... And you're supposed to smile, two toothless smiles there. <laughs> there is a sequence of my mother crossing that path and me hiding behind this leaf that again, there was this complete sense of unreality because he told me, you have to bend down and hide behind this leaf. And of course I couldn't and wouldn't say anything to this large, beautiful man that this is absurd, but I did feel it was very strange that 
I couldn't hide myself behind a leaf. It's only a leaf. But, yeah, tried my best. <laughs> Uma, the older Durga, Uma Dashgupta, I remember she was probably a little older than she looked. And with me, she did treat me like a little sister. I remember once when that sari, I had to wear the sari, and that's another thing that was funny. I had to strip to wear that sari. I couldn't even wear my panties. Because what if the camera caught the lines, you know, from the back? Not allowed. In those days, little girls, they were a sari, they were just a sari. So I remember once she said, I'll put it on you, and I was feeling shy, and she said, don't worry. I'm older than you, I'm your older sister. And she tied the sari around me. So I remember Uma, but I only remember her as an older sisterly presence. There's one thing that I keep remembering about those days, which I think is rather nice. It's about the smells. I remember smells like Shubhrata Mitra, the cameraman. They always had light meters in those days. So every shot, he'd bring his light meter under my nose. And his fingers were long, brown with nicotine. And there was this nicotine flavor. I wouldn't call it a bad smell. It was quite nice. Every day when we went for shooting, my mother and I would be Bhongshi Chandragupta would come with this thin piece of cloth, torn piece, hold it open, and there would be two little nose studs, which we wear in the film. Mine was sky blue, and he would fix it with something called Durofix, which was really cow gum, you know, and had this heady smell. Loved it. We definitely sniffed glue <laughs> right through with those nose studs sticking in our nose. It was completely amazing how the public reacted to Potipatili. It wasn't just a fact of how much Bengalis loved this novel, but this was the first time they saw something on Bengali screen that related to actual life, as if the story was actually being visualized rather than acted out with makeup and costumes. Hi. There was a constant sense of celebration about the film itself. I mean, there were foreign delegates as well who came in, and every time they came to visit, there'll be these shows of Pothipatili, even though the government initially, don't forget, in West Bengal, had objected to so much poverty being shown on screen. I mean, films should be entertainment and therefore not real at all, and poverty is something to be hidden away. But of course, we always cried at the end of the film, you know, however many times we saw it, we shed tears. That was typical. Everybody constantly saw Patil in Bengal. My mother continued to live the rest of her life exactly the way she did before the film. People would go past us saying, Kurna Banichi, Kurna Banichi. <laughs> she just would stone facedly ignore it. She was not going to change her life because of this, and she really never did. But the effect that Patil Pacelli had on people around her, she was recognized forever. In Patil Pacelli Shubir, who was Opu, he, as far as I know, just went back to his old life, wherever he came from. And very recently, a filmmaker in Bengal has picked his story, his real story up, and uh, made a film called Opur Pacheli, which is about his life and how the film has affected his life. Uma also must have just gone back to her life because except for rare interviews, I don't think she ever really appeared anywhere where people would 
know her as a child actress. I never thought of my role as being of great significance. It was interesting for me in later life to think back, but it was always Uma, the older Durga, who had so much more to do and did it so marvelously well. It did affect my life for a long time. People would turn to me and say, oh, you're the one who ran after the train. You're the one who did this or that. None of which I did. I only picked up the cats. So um, it would be explanation time. And I hated that. I didn't care if I'm not remembered. I don't want to be remembered as the wrong person. <laughs> At the same time, if I watch the films, they affect me still as deeply as they did before. <laughs>